So I am going to give you a bit of an introduction to social investment. That's what I've been asked to do today. Um, stop me at any time with questions, um, stick them in the chat or do switch your cameras on and wave at me. That's absolutely fine. Um, what I will do is share some slides and take you through some basic things about social investment and about the difference between social investment and grant. And I'll talk a little bit about our experience at SIB as well in analysing the kinds of investments that we've made and the extent to which um, those investments have been equitable and fairly distributed across uh, the range of applicants. And we've found that, uh, that generally speaking, that's not the case. Um, so it's, it's been an interesting time for us in the last year and trying to really make sense of, of our funding. Um, what I'm going to try and do now is just share my screen and show some show some slides. Um, can everyone see that? Can you see a slide that says social investment? A very brief introduction. Hopefully everyone can. Let me just move to that. Um, so I'm just going to whiz through these. Um, I won't spend too long on them, but as I say, do do stop me. And in fact, now that I'm sharing my screen, if you if you want to just jump in, do go ahead um, because I won't necessarily see people's faces, which are on the the right hand side now. Um, there are different kinds of finance that you can access um, in if you're a social purpose organisation. Um, grant will presumably be familiar, but that is uh, gifted money. It's usually restricted. It's usually project based. Um, and it is quite hard for it to be, <laughs> generally speaking, quite hard to get hold of unrestricted grants, even when funders claim that they're, they're going to pay core costs. It's actually quite a difficult thing to do under charity law. Then there's investment, which is in the form of debt. So that is loan finance. Uh, that has that comes with interest payments and uh, sometimes a request for a requirement for security as well to guarantee the loan. Um, and the third kind of investment is equity. And equity is when you take shares in a company. Um, and the exit for the investor usually comes through an increase in share value and a selling on of, of the shares that someone has purchased. Uh, so those are kind of the big three. Slips. Um, social investment in the UK is a narrower version of these things. So social investment in the UK context in particular is largely debt, and it's debt which is loaned to social purpose organisations. Generally speaking, in the UK, that's been charities, but it does to an extent also include social enterprises of various kinds and some mutuals. Um, so it is usually debt. It's money that's repaid with interest. Um, it uh, is. It can be fairly long term. Sorry, my own face is um, obscuring my slide. Um, and it can be arranged without security. So one of the big differences between social investment and um, investment in the in the uh, private sector, if you like, is that it is possible to get an unsecured loan. So unsecured loans are pretty difficult to get for most charities and social enterprises, particularly because the business models of most of those organisations are pretty marginal. So they're considered to be highly risky organisations to loan to. So part of what social investment does is to make that kind of debt available to organisations that would be turned down typically uh, by traditional banks. Um, another feature of social investment is that it can be blended so a blended loan is a loan which is made alongside a grant. Um, and the amount of grant that is blended with the loan can vary. Uh, the funds that we've run at Social Investment Business have tended to have a fairly large share of grants blended into them. So the oldest funds had gone up to 40% of the overall value. So fairly significant. Um, blends of, of grant and loan and the way that those are blended can differ so you can you can blend that money in different sorts of ways so sometimes the blend is the cash transferred is all in the form of um, of a loan but there might be money made available to uh, develop the business to um, get access to additional kinds of business support um, and in some cases it, it is a, a cash grant alongside um, alongside a loan 
equity is very, very rare in social investment. Um, largely, that's because social purpose organisations can't issue shares. Uh, so there's very there's a very small number of social purpose organisations, as in the legal forms, are able to issue shares. Um, there are some kicks, um, some community interest companies that can issue shares, uh, but generally speaking, it's very difficult to to have equity like money um, in in social investment. Uh, there is a thing that we talk about, which is quasi equity. And those are various sorts of products which are equity like, um, which means that they don't require repayment and interest payments in the same way as debt would. I can come back to, to quasi equity if anyone's interested. It's, it's a fairly complex area and there's not a huge amount of it around, but I can talk a bit more about it if people are interested. Um, the fourth thing that I thought I would touch on because it may be familiar or you may have heard of it is something which is called community shares. Um, community shares are a particular kind of equity that is issued by community benefit societies. Um, and they're, they're unusual sorts of shares. So they are withdrawable but non-transferable. What that basically means is that there's no secondary market for community shares. So it's a bit like the kind of equity that you would take in the private sector. You know, you would buy shares in a conventional company. Um, but with community shares, you can't trade them. So there's no... Uh, there's, there aren't sort of stock exchanges for community shares. Um, essentially what happens is you buy a share in a company and you hold on to that share, usually for quite a long period of time, and ultimately you should be able to withdraw it. So mm -hmm. if you put in 500 pounds into a community benefit society, at some point in the future, you mm -hmm. should be able to withdraw your 500 pounds again. Um, but typically with community shares, it won't have accrued, so it won't be worth more money um, and you won't be able to trade those shares. Um, again, if that's something that people are interested in, I can come back and talk a bit more about community shares. They, they're typically issued in quite a narrow set of circumstances. Um, so the short story is, <laughs> the sort of short version of, of this is that um, for most social purpose organisations, there's really two choices. There's grant or there's debt. Um, and although there are some other products around, they're, they're not, there aren't very many of them. Um, the social investment market doesn't really operate like the private sector. It doesn't look or feel like an open market of different banks that offer products that you can pick and choose from. This may be already something that is familiar from, from the grant landscape. So I would say that social investment uh, does operate quite like grants in the UK, generally speaking, in that most people who have accessed social investment have done so because they have a good relationship with, with a particular social investor. So it's not like shopping around for a um, a product or, or a you know a, a your broadband supplier, for instance. It's not that there are lots and lots and lots of different social investors out there, all offering broadly speaking the same sort of product, and you try and get the best one for you. That isn't really what it's like. It is much more like grant funders um, in the sense that, that in the ways that I think will be familiar. So organizations that have their own particular interests, the, their own particular ideas about what they want to fund and the ways that they will make people jump through hoops to receive their money. I don't know if that's the, the real, you know, the realistic picture is that it looks much more like grant funding than it does like banking. Um, and the reality is that social investment is mediated by relationships. So if you have a good relationship with a social investor, you're introduced to a social investor, that will serve you very well, just as it does with, with grant funding. Um, reputation and uh, connections do make a big difference in this world. Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about SIB in particular. Um, so social investment business, we have been around for quite a long time in social investment terms. And um, so we predate Big Society Capital, which is the, the large wholesaler in social um, And we predate uh, them by, by some, by good, a solid sort of 10 years, more or less. Um, and SIB has been running funds largely for government for a very long time. So the oldest funds that we have run are down there in the bottom of the screen, so Future Builders, the Adventure Capital Fund and Community Builders. So those go back um, almost 20 years. So those funds were started kind of in the early, very early noughties, 2002, 2003. And those are the amounts of money that we distributed through those. So 180 million pounds of loans alongside 133 million pounds of grant and um, 45 million in blended deals. So there's quite quite large amounts of money that have have been funded through SIB 
that have gone usually in the form of these blended finance deals. So a certain amount of loan and a certain amount of grant. Um, and I can talk a bit more about the kinds of organisations that we funded, if that's of interest. But typically we funded quite large organisations. So most of the organisations we funded in these early loan funds were uh, had the average turnover was about £780,000 a year. So a fairly big um, organisation. So we're pretty well established. They've mostly been around at least a decade. Um, and almost all of them were very heavily involved in contracted work for either central or local government or the NHS. Um, and the big aim of Future Builders was to increase the amount of contracted work that was going into social purpose organisations. Uh, and it did that reasonably successfully. Um, and most of these organisations did, uh, did do quite well with the money that they, they had from this particular set of funds. They did grow um, on the whole. Most organisations grew. Um, as in they increased their turnover, they increased their assets, they hired more people. I mean, they grew in most, most of the ways you would think of as growth. Uh, austerity didn't has not helped them. Many of them um, were doing very, very well until 2010 and then have taken a fairly significant hit. Um, but they, they have largely been, they, those have largely been interesting and successful programs, um, but at the large end of, of the market. Um, I just wanted to say kind of quickly on this um, that, so one of the interesting things I think with social investment, and there are arguments that go back and forth about this, but social investment really isn't for everyone, is, is what I kind of wanted to say. Um, so there's lots of talk in, in the last few years, particularly there's been a big emphasis on sustainability and resilience in social organisations and then thinking about how to become a, a sustainable social purpose organisation and what that means and whether trading forms a part of that. Can trading help a social purpose organisation to be more sustainable and be more resilient. I guess what I would say always as the starting point for this is that sustainability for a social purpose organization is a model that helps you to be sustained, to keep going. That's what matters um, in a social purpose organization. And that if you are doing that very successfully by accessing grant, that is not a less good way of being a social purpose organization than one that takes on investment. So investment isn't, isn't, a, isn't a sort of, um, it's not a gold star, right? I mean, it's, it can be a useful form of finance in a certain set of circumstances, but it does have to be understood as a particular kind of uh, finance. It does come with certain sorts of strings attached and certain kinds of costs. Um, and you really have to think about whether with those things, with those costs and those difficulties in mind, is this, is this the right kind of finance for you? Um, and typically, um, repayable finance is most suited to organizations that have some sort of trading income in that you could i mean you could if you're a big enough charity clearly you can take on social investment and pay it back through pay back the interest and the capital through donations if you wanted to or through other kinds of approaches but you need to have money coming through your organization that allows to ser allows you to service the debt um, which can be quite hard to do if the bulk of your income comes from grants, because as we saw previously, most grants are attached to projects and they're restricted income. And so it's difficult to free up money from those sources to service this kind of debt, and you will need to service the debt. Um, so trading organisations, trading social purpose organisations have typically been those that have taken on social investment. And then if you're thinking about trading, if you don't currently have trading as part of, of what you do as a social purpose organization, you really have to think about what trading offers to your business model. And I think it is really important to weigh up the pros and the cons to that. Um, and I don't think that is always done as, as well as it could be. So it could be that it, it adds to your bottom line. There might be really good reasons why you want to add trading to the way that you operate your organization. Um, but you yeah, can Samuel. Oh, sorry, someone... <laughs> Is someone asking something? Uh, that will they? Judy, I think you've unmuted. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, I keep going. <laughs> I'm here to I'm here to ask for your help. Ngorwa Ndeva and Yenata. 
Judy, you need to go on mute, love. Judy, Sorry. we can hear your conversation. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, where was I? Uh, trading, yes. So um, the, the, one of the things that can happen if you pivot towards a trading business model is that that can have an impact on the, the social good that you are trying to do because your, your staff time and your resources can be geared towards doing this new piece of trading or this new part of your business and that can can have it you can it can take away time and resource from the good that you want to do um, and so it's really important to think about that um, in this co in this context um, so it's really just to say that it's not for everyone and that there's nothing to be ashamed of if it's not for you and um, that it isn't it doesn't make better organizations it's just one sort of finance that can be helpful in certain circumstances um, and I just thought it might be helpful to pick up on some of those differences. So I've just laid out some of the, the differences here uh, between grants and, and loans. Um, so grants are in the UK typically short term. So it's pretty rare to be able to access a grant that, that goes on that lasts for more than three years. So based on the three, 300, 360 giving data, which is our best source of information about grants, um, most grants are still actually around two years. Large capital grants can go up to three years, but you know it's these are short term. <laughs> these are short term grants um, that uh, that you can access in the UK. Um, loans can be much longer term, not always, um, but they can be. So the Future Builders loans that I was talking about earlier, that Social Investment Business um, manages, the average loan term in those funds is fourteen years. So you know those are really much, much, much longer term finance. Um, and we expect, well, we know that at the moment that average is getting longer and longer. We would expect many of these loans to last at least 20 years. So they start looking a lot more like mortgages. Um, grants are usually restricted. Um, it can be hard to cover, cover core costs with grants. Uh, loans, the restrictions are far less onerous. So typically you, you, you don't, there aren't very large, very significant um, restrictions on loan finance. Um, grant typically has to be spent, usually by a particular period of time. Um, that's not the, the case with, with loans, um, nor is it the case with blended finance either. So there's not usually um, restrictions on when you can spend the money. Certainly there won't be restrictions on when you can spend the loan as long as you continue to service the interest. Um, grants are usually drawn down against delivery targets. So it's unusual, not impossible, but it's unusual to be able to draw down the full amount of a large grant in one go. Um, but that is the norm with a loan. And in fact, with a blended grant and loan is that you get all of the money in one lump sum immediately, um, which you know can sit on your balance sheet and that can be helpful in itself. Uh, there's no direct financial costs with a grant. There are direct financial costs with a loan. You have to service that loan, uh, but there'll be indirect costs in both cases. So in, with grants, you have indirect costs in monitoring against your milestones and feeding back to your funders. Um, there's obviously costs in having to continue to apply for grants. Um, those costs can, can be not inconsiderable for, for organisations. Uh, the costs in those terms are usually less for a loan. So the, the kind of monitoring that you have to do, particularly if you're paying your interest payments as expected, there's not actually a huge amount of monitoring when there's much less than you would expect in grant in, with a grant. Um, flexibility and uh, will, will depend with a grant on the relationship that you have with a funder. So some funders are great and they do vary the terms of grants and they talk to their grantees and they are willing to listen to your problems and to flex in accordance to them. Others are not. Others are pretty restrictive and they expect you to, to stick to those restrictions. Um, Again, with the loans, I mean, it, it differs by, by investor, but um, I would say that social investment business has, we have typically been a very flexible investor. Um, so there's, I think there's an average of about four variations-ish across all of the loans in our old loan book. Um, but that can go up to, I think the, the largest number was about 14 or 15 variations on, on the loan um, on the, in the Future Builders portfolio. And those will be really significant things. So those, those will be changes in, the amount of interest payments, there'll be repayment holidays, there'll be additional grant layered in alongside write-offs of parts of the loans. Um, we're typically a very flexible investor. Um, 
I thought it might be helpful just to pick up a little bit on the sorts of things you might want to think about if you were going to apply for a loan. Um, I think these are helpful questions. Uh, so think about the amount of money that you need, your ability to repay it and how much, how much time it might take you to repay. I would also say that it's worth thinking too about what you would use to repay the capital sum. Um, I, one of the things that we found, particularly with our most recent loan funds, is that the more high impact the organisation is, according to, to our criteria, and we have a way of measuring impact, but the, the more, more impactful the organisation, the harder they typically find it to repay the capital and the more likely they are to be repaying capital through selling assets. And there are sometimes very good reasons for selling assets. You know, assets are not always things you want to hold on to, but it is a little bit of a concern that, that the most high impact organisations think that the only way they can repay the capital is through, um, is through selling assets. Um, the, the revenue model, so how are you going to deliver activities that generate a sufficient income stream to repay investors? So that's kind of the trading point I was making previously. You, you have to have enough money each month um, out of which you can pay your interest payments um, and also you know, perhaps start building up a sufficient surplus to repay the capital. Uh, so thinking about your business model, you will, if you apply for a loan, uh, you are going to have to do quite a lot of due diligence in order to show that you're going to be able to repay um, both the interest and then ultimately the capital. So you will have to have a good um, track record of delivery to be able to be clear about the, your products and services, your customers and who they are, who your competitors are. Um, there's, there's more... Uh, more market-based information than you would typically have to give um, when you are applying for a grant. It does also really help to have a clear vision of your social impact. Um, that can mean different things to different people. We're very clear about what it means to us and there's lots more information on our website, which I can point you towards if you're interested. Um, we look very much at, at enterprise level impact. So we are interested in funding organizations that are good employers, that have good equalities practices, that, um, uh, understand their supply chains, um, all sorts of, and, and are reasonably financially resilient. We would never, um, we don't use our impact scores as a way of, uh, as, as thresholds in the funding that we give, but we do, we do consider the scores um, as part of our decision making. Um, and then legal structure matters as well, because as I was saying, there are certain sorts of organisations that, that, um, that can't access certain sorts of social investment. Um, so I think those are the main things. Um, I might just, I will, um, I'll come out of this and stop sharing the screen. Um, just before we, we, I open it up to questions, I just, I wanted to just say a little bit about our experience of funding um, black and minority ethnic led organisations. Um, in the current fund, we have a fund that just closed, so they closed at the end of March, um, which was our biggest loan fund that we've been running in the last, um, last couple of years. And that fund has given out about £25 million in a year um, to a range of social purpose organisations. It's also given out a substantial amount of grants, um, not quite £4 million worth of grants, uh, alongside those loans. Um, and it has, it was a, a specific COVID fund, so it was, it, the, it was aiming to sustain organisations that had taken a very substantive hit because of COVID and whose business models were, were struggling as a result. Um, and it was, it's a generalist fund, so pretty much anyone could apply for the money. The, the only major restrictions were on size, so organisations had to have turnover of at least 400k. Um, but that was pretty much it. Otherwise, we were fairly open to all kinds of social purpose organisations. Um, that being the case, we had 56 applicants overall who were black and minority ethnic led. Of those, only 13 were found to be eligible for the fund and only three received any money under it. So that's less than 5% overall. Um, and of, the, of those eligible, only 23% received funding. Um, where 66% of non-BME organisations receive funding. So this is just to say that uh, I think it is still quite hard um, for, for many black minority ethnic led organisations to apply for this kind of finance. 
I think we have found, I think it's worth saying that we've done quite a lot of research across all of the funds and programs that we run, and that includes lots of grants funding as well. So in the last year, we have made grants of less than 5k, and the biggest loan that we made was 1.22 million. So it was a big old range in the kind of finance that we offer. What we have found across all of those programs is, and this consistently, there's a very, very strong trend across all of our our programs and a decent sample size, I should say, as well. So we we have a good sample of, of about 5,000 social purpose organisations that have applied to us for finance. Among, of, of those organisations, about 2,000 are black and minority ethnic led. And um, so this is it's not they're not enormous numbers, but they're not tiny numbers either. It's not a sample size that is this completely um, uh, tiny and therefore not not representative. Um, but we have found across all of those funds and programs consistently that black and minority led um, organizations have uh, have faced multiple barriers to accessing um, to accessing that money and that a lot of the biggest issues don't even come in at the decision making stage they come in prior to that so eligibility criteria have been a consistent issue and the fund where we had the highest rate of um, success for black and minority led ap applicants was the fund that had the, the most open framework for eligibility. So organizations could apply when they were unincorporated. Um, they could apply uh, for very small amounts of money. They could apply um, in very flexible kinds of ways. And we found that those that that made a huge difference. And that particular fund, um, almost 70% of those approved for funding were from black and minority ethnic backgrounds. And so that I think is, is has been a very, um, very sort of telling uh, set of findings for us and has been really interesting. We haven't got, we haven't necessarily got clear answers as to as to why we're finding this consistent set of problems, but, but we do see issues in the fragility of those organizations. So um, financial fragility has been a big issue, particularly with COVID. We've also found that those are organ that these are organisations that have more consistent short-term problems. So we ask a series of standard questions to everyone who applies across our funds, um, and we have found, and those are about um, paying your costs as an organisation. So are you able to pay your staff? Do you have enough money to pay your running costs? How soon are you going to run out of money? There's a sort of set of standard set of questions that we ask, and we found again consistently that black and minority ethnic led organisations are more likely to have immediate issues with their finances. And that, you know, that will have ongoing problems. The other thing that I would say as well, and again, this has been a consistent finding, is that these organizations tend to apply for less money. So one of the issues, one of the, the things that we are trying to look for always is not only to try and represent the volume. So if we've had 20% of applicants from uh, black minority ethnic led organizations, we want to see 20% of approvals, right? We want to try and see that there's a consistent proportion moving through our programs from the start to the end. But that's one thing, that's one thing to be looking for is that proportionality. The other is about value. And what is has been consistently difficult to do is to be equitable, not only by volume, but by value. And that is because we have found, again, completely consistently that the people who apply for most money are uh, organizations led by white men and those organizations will always ask for more and um, we've also found that the organizations that most successfully not only ask for more but receive more have already received funding either from us or from an existing partner so reputation effects are very very strong in our data um, and these are you, you can see how these end things end up being cyclical if it is the case that you are already successful and you have the reputation and you have the relationship and you feel that you can apply for more money and um, you just consist you breaking that cycle is quite difficult to do you have to you have to think about how can you rebalance how can we find a way to um to give to give out money in different sorts of ways i'm not saying we have an answer i am saying that we are trying very very hard to think about these things and to think about um not only the volume but also the value um I'll stop there so that we have time for questions. Does anyone have any specific questions? A couple of comments. I've just, just yeah. had my hand up 
So, Jen, and one of your investees. Mm -hmm. So, I've been with SIB. Um, it's something that I inherited. And I can talk from our perspective um, and for the, the benefit of the attendees of this seminar that um, we've had a really good relationship with SIB. Um, it was our, the original loan that I hadn't applied for, but my predecessor had, was ACF, was the Adventure Capital Fund. Yeah, and so over the, the last, long. yeah, over, over the way, the, the time that we've been working together, um, I've been, I've found SIB to be um, supportive in terms of understanding the various different needs that we've gone through over the, that period. Um, I would say, as somebody who has received funding, and we didn't have 400,000 in the bank when <laughs> we applied, I know that for a fact, because it was when it was a new investment. Um, and it's quite interesting to hear that you're just saying that now, because that's quite a lot, especially for a, a black organisation to try and even, that, that's a big put off straight off. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say one of the things that would be interesting for SIB to do is to do some kind of um, forum discussion with its current black organizations who have received and are in receipt of a loan or grant and to ask them the questions, you know, what has helped. I would say SIB has been really good at being um, understanding of the, the different needs, the different changes that a charity goes through or an organization. It has also helped, not just financially. I think, you know, the financial is a, is a plus. But what I found more um, rewarding from SIP is the advice, the professional advice at times throughout the, those, those years that I got when I got business advice, better business advice, you know, how to, they've sent somebody in to help to work with me to actually make the business better. Um, I think in terms of the social outputs, the social outputs of now to what it used to be when I first inherited this um, relationship was we used to always have to do the social output reports every month and it was a nightmare and it was like, mm -hmm. oh, will you go away? You know, let us give you a good lead in and a good report, you know, maybe twice a year or annually. Um, and I think that going forward, you know, there's the whole social value measuring now. Mm -hmm. And it'd be really good for a funder to look not just at their criteria, but to kind of introduce the social value of organisations and what they can offer and what they are offering. Because very often the, the pound social value to the work that's being done by the Black voluntary sector is really high for lots of different reasons. Um, so I I personally would like to see us have a discussion mm -hmm. as, you know, SIB and its um, contacts, contracts, you know, users, um, so we can look at what has been the, the problems. I'm quite horrified to hear that there was only three successful applicants, but I totally understand mm -hmm. why, because I know how strong you are in terms of criteria and the need to, for people to be able to manage the money that they're getting. Um, but I also think that there's also another element of SIB, that, SIB support that could be out there, and that's preparing organisations to actually yep. be applicant ready for their, their loans. I've, got, I've had great relationships with lots of different officers and, and directors over the years. And one of the things I've always done is be dead truthful with them. It's just mm -hmm. say, listen, it's not working or that's fabulous. Um, and building that relationship. You know, I haven't gone for multiple, multiple grants, um, but I might do. <laughs> but <laughs> now that I know that you'll support the ones that you're already supporting. But the, the main thing for me is the relationship building between mm -hmm. funders and organisations. I think that is the most important and critical thing I think that funders need to, to factor in the different needs of the different organisations. I would be really impressed with a funder that starts with an organisation that's got a very small turnover and helps that organisation to grow. 
So it does become one of you 400,000 mm -hmm. annual turnover mm -hmm. organisations because that is the real, the, the real truth and the, the journey of the organisations and of the funders' um, relationships um, yeah. in Liverpool. Yeah. We've I think just... it's a, so one of the things that we're thinking about, the, the last, that fund that had the 400k um, mm. cut off, that was, um, well, that was for a few, few reasons, but partly to do with the, the, the guarantees that we had from the British Business Bank and various other things. But mm. we wouldn't, um, we really have learned from this, this process. And, and one of the things that we have tried to do much more than we ever used to is to both look for the look at the data and publish it really openly so those yeah. those stats that i'm giving you we publish that on a weekly basis that so we're yeah. totally open about the fact that we yeah. um we have failed <laughs> to, to to create an equitable fund like we do we're, we're very very aware of those barriers and so what we but um but we need the awareness of the barriers in order to be able to tackle them and so well, if, what, you ask, if you ask the people that's why i'm saying if you ask us where where it's gone right where it's gone wrong what, could, what, what should both they and us consider for the future? You mm -hmm. know, the, that, that building relationship of how, how um, that fund benefits both. It benefits yeah. you to, yeah. to bring in more money, to, to give out more money. It benefits us in terms of going from a small organisation or an organisation that's really struggling to one who can learn to become, you know, partly self-sustainable. The other thing is that we've had the pandemic and the pandemic has hit really hard mm -hmm. on lots of the voluntary sector organisations um, in the country. And yeah. the, the story is no different from city to city where people are really, really struggling even just to pay salaries. So I think that those kinds of issues need to be taken into consideration when funders are looking at how they can help. So, yeah, you know, agree. we talk yeah. about restricted and unrestricted. There needs to be that bit of a, an element and a balance. Because I'll tell you, as the CEO of a charity, I love it if I get unrestricted funding because I'm like, thank God, they, they, they have faith in how I'm going to manage this. Yeah. It's really hard it. when you're trying to fit the... The, and it can be it the, can be a genuine the, benefit of a blended yeah. of a blended product and that one of the things that alone can do is that it can just it, it enables the handing over of a much larger long, lump sum for a much longer period of time than you can typically do just with a pure grant so i think it does have huge advantages the we are working at the moment on hopefully reopening a new loan fund and as part of that we will be thinking completely differently about how we how we um particularly how we engage with black and minority ethnic led organizations yeah. and the aim there is to is to open up that conversation so part yeah. of what we're trying to do is to is to think differently not just about how the support that we offer and the point at which we offer that support but also the different criteria that are used to make assessments i think that there are um, that those assessments are uh, inequitable inevitably because because of the barriers that have existed for such a long time for these organizations if you're talking about a group of organizations that have, have been uh, historically undercapitalized you can't go from being historically undercapitalized yeah. to suddenly being able to access money it's not that's not a single yeah. step well you, you can to, do small you can do a journey together you can there. take each step and that's that's what i'm saying yeah, let's yeah, look yeah. at the different steps that need to be taken Completely to agree. take and those you, smaller organizations so next time when you've got a grant from a grant out, you're getting more than three people who are successful at it. You know, yeah. um, and, and like I said, I, I've got a brilliant reputation with Sib, you know, but it, it, it has always been based on just me being really honest with them by, you know, telling them, yes, this is a good point or no, this isn't. And then mm -hmm. also tapping into the support that, the, the, the additional support, like the business advice or the marketing or whatever, mm -hmm. I, I've got a really good officer that I'm, that's assigned to me at, in, in Liverpool, Christian, Christian mm -hmm. Standard. So we can talk and he gets what when we're, we're, when we're at a point. And, you know, I'll listen to what he's saying as well as him listening to me. Mm -hmm. And that is the, I think that's the, the balance. It's, it's, you're not, an, and I want to get it across to the attendees as well. You're not that type of loan investor that doesn't listen. I know that, so that's why I'm saying it. 
because I don't want people saying <laughs> after the presentation you just give them like oh my god you know I I want to say to the attendees use our listeners so you know if people have got ideas if people want to know you know to to at least have the conversation they might still not be able to go for it but at least have the conversation start to build up as an individual organization what is it you need to say what is it you need to do because that's the only way we learn to to mm -hmm. infiltrate and to get into these sectors or these these opportunities that we haven't had in the past yeah, thanks, Michelle. Uh, there's a couple of other questions. So yeah. I think Laura does, and Leslie as well has had his hand up for for a while. Leslie, do you want to go first, and then um, Laura? Yes. Um, thanks, Jen. So I I agree entirely with everything that Michelle said. Um, we, my organisation, has also been a, a beneficiary of the um, uh, SID uh, loan and and, and grant um, in the past. And we have found that extremely um, beneficial. That's probably one of the reasons why we're still uh, existing as an organization and uh, are in a stronger position than a lot of our, uh, um, our competitors or compatriots uh, locally. Um, but what you've outlined in, in terms of recent, um, recently in terms of the uh, successful applications to, um, um, to um, uh, an eligibility doesn't surprise me. I, I'd actually had a look at the, the COVID uh, recovery um, funding and thought, wow, turnover of uh, 400 or 500K to, to be eligible, um, it's not even worth me actually having a discussion with um, Sib, even you know, despite you know, our, our previous relationship. The, the thing to bear in mind is that a lot of black and, and, and Asian minority businesses are, are, um, are in the whole, um, um, are in the startup phase or they're in a development phase and they're not likely to have that level of turnover. So it doesn't surprise me that, you know, we, we had so few organizations that were uh, eligible in terms of their current turnover to be able mm -hmm. to access the fund. So I don't feel necessarily that um, uh, it, it may be uh, the bar has been set so high that uh, unintentionally it's, it's excluded quite a significant number of uh, or section of the community that could really benefit from having this kind of investment and alongside that investment having the guidance and support, which I know uh, S um, SIB actually um, provide to it, its, um, its grantees or, um, or organizations, its beneficiaries that it's support. Um, and so maybe for me, it suggests that um, taking up the point that uh, Michelle's making, uh, having a conversation with uh, organizations like us who's actually been through the process and benefited from it um, as well as having discussion with those people who haven't succeeded may uh, may give um, uh, some pointers then in terms of what could be done in the future in terms of structuring not only um, the COVID funding but other funding so that it gives bigger um, reach and better opportunity and support to um, to sections of the community that are automatically um, excluded from mainstream. So, you know, it, it's kind of a, a double-edged sword, I guess. You're, you're not going to get the money from mainstream bank and SIB is supposed to be one of those organizations that's supposed to be um, where um, organizations can turn to to start up their enterprise or to develop it but the bar has been set so high that you know we can't meet that and the only way we're going to do that in all honesty is for the bar to be lowered so that you know um, there are smaller amounts of funding realistically that people can apply for blended funding not not just uh, loans but blended funding with the support so that you know um, the concerns that you have, you work with those businesses to overcome the um, 
um, the, the problems rather than seeing the problems first and saying, well, we can't work with that. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. And we, we um, yes, as I say, all I can say at the moment is that that with any new fund, we, we would do all of these things. And uh, so, so I think we are very, very aware that the, the criteria were um, particularly restrictive on that on that fund and that the the turnover of cut off was too high um, and equally that there was um there was a much more significant need for pre and post um investment support um and that th those would be things that we would we would want to do i mean i should say we we do have a decent track record of making sure that the biggest um blend so that the highest amount of grant does typically go to organizations working in the most deprived areas um, and uh, and with and with communities that are most in need. So I think we're we're reasonably good at doing that on a on a case by case basis. But I think there's a need here to do more than just that. Um, I think it's the, the criteria just need to be different. So I think or different pot, or, or or a a, a ring fence pot um, specifically. Well, yeah, for... I'm 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 very interested in the idea of a ring fence pot. Actually, I don't think we're quite there yet, but I think it's an interesting. Either ring fence, either it's a specific pot, or it's a, or it's as I say, it's more the 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 value, um, the proportionate value should be right. So say for instance you have, um, so to go back to my example, if you had if you had say twenty percent of applicants who were Black, Asian, minority, ethnic, and you had twenty percent who by by uh, volume had received funding, but by value it was much lower, you would you would ring fence the amount of money that was to make it 20%, sorry if I've explained that really badly, but what I mean is you would make sure that the amount of value was a, was correct as well, even if those individual loans and grants were still too low, you would make sure that the pot of money was set aside for those organisations to, to access at different points over the lifetime. Does that make, okay, that so, make sense? Sorry to cut you, so we're talking about having um, parity. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Lara had a question. Um, yeah. Uh, um, can you hear me? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Um, yes. I agree with what, what both Michelle and um, I can't remember the name of the chap that was speaking. Thank you. Um, was saying just now, but I'm I'm wondering if um, I think it's a good idea to speak to the people who had been who've received funding from the from Black Asian minority, um, but. Is there any way that all of the people who applied before who were declined that they can be approached and ask them what it is that they needed? Because I think these are the conversations because if you only need a certain, if they've all applied for a certain amount, which is you ring fence up to that amount, but actually ask them what they needed or what they felt that they needed in order to get themselves to the next level. I think we're, we're operating in a really difficult system where we have been black people have been socialized to be dependent and as a consequence we have all fallen into the grants um area and i think that there needs to be some help in trying to be an entrepreneur and to be enterprising and maybe what is needed is you need to part maybe partner with another organization that can support that element as well as you offering the funds yeah, so I think it might even be one step beyond talking to people about what they think they need to get to the next step, because I think precisely for your for the reasons you've outlined, and this is also true of organisations led by women, is that um, is that the perception of of what you can ask for is so much more restricted compared to some other uh, leaders of organisations that there's a need to kind of say. Um, to, to listen to that, but then to probably say and have twenty five percent more. Do you see what I mean? So not not just to say, um, yeah. it, it's 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 to it's to go beyond that and to to in essence that the parity needs to be aligned to um, to organisations who would who would seek far more funding rather than to say we are just listening. You know, not that I don't want to listen. I'm not saying I'm not completely open to listening and co-designing with with organisations, but it's to just to be the, the, the cyclical nature of that underinvestment is never going to be broken unless no. there's a redistribution. 
of absolutely what you can do is the thing that the difficulty is that i think that as black organizations we understand you know if you if you approach a grants organization they always say go to go for the smaller amount you know if you go for ace they'll say go for under fifteen thousand. so we understand that our value there's a perception that our value and how we can get funding is really really very low whereas as you're saying white men will say well you know we're worth we're worth this is worth way more you know we don't even pay ourselves the same amount so, but I think it's worth having those conversations where you then say, okay, if you go with blue sky thinking, what is the ultimate? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and if you say, where do you want to see that organization in five years? And actually that's what they apply for at that time. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I think it is looking, yeah, it, it's um, it's one of those things they say, it's a, it's a sort of social psychology thing is that if you've experienced deprivation, you perceive the, the world as, as a domain of force. And if you've experienced nothing but good stuff, you perceive it as a domain of opportunity. And yeah. so, um, yeah, it can be very, the, the realignment of, of, that, of that set of expectations is also really important. It's to say that you have the right to these things. You can, you can aspire to, 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 the, to that level of growth and that amount of, of support, but that's not, um, yeah, that's not just for other people. Um, apparently I only have one minute, so I might have to have to end on, on that note, but um, do please um, feel free to, to, to get to stay in touch or get in touch. And, um, and uh, Michelle and Leslie, I will certainly be in touch with both of you. <laughs> Thank you very Great. much indeed for your no. feedback today. That was really helpful. Okay. Thanks, everyone.